Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us on the day we launch the EUA position on the European Green Deal. So my name is Stefan Merkmans, and I am the Director for Research Innovation at EUA. So even if it might be somewhat connected with energy issues, it does not matter. I want to start by mentioning the ongoing crisis in Ukraine that is and will uh, be affecting us all, but it is really the people I'm thinking of. My thoughts are with all academics, all staff and all students in Ukrainian universities and with all Ukrainians, Ukrainians more broadly. Uh, you are in our thoughts and you are uh, you have all of our support, of course. Uh, let me start by being very open with you uh, uh, and admit that uh, this EUA initiative actually on the Green Deal all started somewhat negatively. It came from uh, the surprise that in the, uh, in, in, in the deep disappointment really that universities are only mentioned really about four times uh, in the whole 2019 Green Deal communications. Uh, universities were very concerned to see so few references to the higher education sector. The, 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 the prospect of no full stakeholder engagement gave the impression that the Green Deal might not be an opportunity for a sector that is already greatly contributing to climate neutrality. But beyond the first surprise, and while our first reaction might have been somewhat negative, the university sector decided to stand ready to support Europe in delivering on its commitments uh, to sustainability and a greener, better future. We are convinced that a systematic engagement with the sector can boost Europe's chances of success by having a green deal that is more consistent, more nuanced and more uh, scientifically informed. So EUA on behalf of Europe's universities definitely welcomes the opportunity to work with the European Commission and national policymakers and invites them to join the university sector in developing a roadmap to enable the vision set in the EUA position. So what we'd like to do uh, actually is uh, start, I see already that uh, we have uh, participants in the, in the hundreds. So I'd like to start a quick poll because we'd like to get an idea of uh, who we're, we're talking uh, to today. So what is your area of activity? I'd like to know if you're from academia, from policymaking, from the industry, civil society, or some uh, other. So looking for your answers now, I can see here at the bottom, most of you are as expected, probably members of EUA. So we've got 82% uh, from academia, We've got a few policymakers. Oh, someone from industry, good. But civil society is somewhat present in some others, so that's very good. So vast majority indeed from academia, good to know, but it's good to see also that we've got other members of the uh, stakeholders that are with us. Uh, thank you very much. The poll will stay open. We've got 124 responses so far. So, um, I'd like to now go to, uh, to my presentation in the slides. There you go, wonderful. So uh, today I will uh, convey the vision from the university sector on the European Green Deal. Uh, I take the opportunity to thank those who contributed uh, to this publication. First, and most importantly, the EUA Energy and Environment Platform with its chair, uh, Professor Douglas Halliday, who will be moderating our panel a little later, but also Chris Fold, who will be speaking right after me. They are the ones who created this position in close collaboration with the EUA Secretariat, and in particular with my colleague, Sergio Okachi. Thank you also to the EUA Research Policy Working Group for their support throughout the process uh, from the time they suggested EUA starts looking into the Green Deal. So, there you go. Uh, I will not say you know, anything new to any of you, I'm sure, when I state that the world, uh, or more specifically humanity, is facing dawning uh, challenges. I think that the pandemic, as well as the Ukraine crisis right now, have shown that this, yes, indeed, we need to become more carbon neutral. We need to be able to develop energy uh, sources that are new 
And also we need to avert energy poverty. And it is about new technologies and new ways of working. And these will require skills, of course. But it's not just about the uh, technology. It's about the interface between those technical solutions and society. So what we're seeing is that new developments at universities are forcing, in a sense, adaptation of the curriculum of learning and teaching, but also the expansion uh, of research, of research-based learning, of entrepreneurship, and of uh, innovation skills. So what is happening is that there's a changing role for universities. Yes, of course, we're seeing, for example, at the level of research, how there's an upgrade and a lot of innovation uh, on the programs that we see at universities. But universities also are open, listening to society, listening to industry, to their needs, uh, and they're collaborating with them. This is allowing for new models of learning and teaching to be developed. For example, much more flexibility now with short courses, with lifelong learning. And uh, what we're seeing, very importantly, both for learning and teaching, but also uh, for research, of course, is the breakdown of silos. Interdisciplinarity is allowing for the use of different types of framework. So with the expert knowledge, with the structure, with the community engagement that you have at universities, really, they are ideal for meeting uh, climate uh, challenge today. So let me go back now to uh, the, uh, the Green Deal itself and the analysis from our EUA experts. So we do welcome the quest for climate neutrality that the European Union has embarked on through this uh, Green Deal. The level of ambition and the grasp of Europe's potential to lead in tackling climate change are very welcome signs of its commitment to deliver a green transition for its citizens. But, and there are buts, the Commission gives the impression that the Green Deal is mainly an economic growth strategy. So even if successful decouple from resource use, which we do think is a flawed argument, it does point at an approach that is heavily reliant on the private sector and less inclusive of different notions of what drives citizens' behavior beyond consumption. Continued growth presents challenges for our standards of living, for equity, and for justice, of course. Benefits of growth are unequal and sustained, and rapid growth will create further inequities in societies. A final but is how the Green Deal's political ambitions are informed by scientific data. Collecting and analyzing the data will not be impactful on its own. It needs integration as part of systemic solutions to climate emergency, and it will remain challenging if it's not part of a holistic approach. Without coherent mechanisms for assessing collating and applying the best available evidence, scientific findings will just be subordinated to political objectives. So universities want a Green Deal that is evidence-based and they have the capacity to offer strong, reliable data to this end. Uh, what enhancements, no, sorry. I am a bit lost with the slides now. I am, I think, here, and there you go. Yes, so what enhancements are needed to answer some of the bugs that I have so far put forward? Well, first, policymakers need to discard outdated views of the university sector as if we would only be a service provider, where we would just transfer skills and information with no involvement whatsoever in the co-creation of solutions. So for now, the Green Deal relied mostly on the private sector and industry in particular. But the Green Deal can not only be industrial uh, about industrial regulations and private consumption. Europe's universities are ready and they are eager to help to co-create the policies necessary for a sustainable society. Universities spread across boundaries between the public and the private sector. They connect local and global communities. They act as honest brokers in knowledge facilitation. They sit at the nexus, really, of various coalitions for change with partners from civil society and from business, uh, for example. 
So leveraging these capabilities for a successful Green Deal is feasible on the condition that policymakers initiate a strategic engagement with the university sector. The structure of both the European Commission and the civil service in many EU member states suggests that much could still be done to address silo thinking for climate goals. A successful transition can only be realized through a full cooperation between a broad range of actors covering, covering the entire spectrum of expertise and knowledge. So, what can universities offer? Uh, first, it is about calibrating, calibrating the various strands of the Green Deal. Here we're talking about a transition that's not just about technology and industry, but also that is social and behavioral. It's about new thinking, new thinking around sustainable well-being beyond the GDP. So we need to exit the past paradigms about growth and consumption that I was mentioning earlier. It's also about evidence-based scrutiny. Uh, of the ways of living in the global north, because they have spillover effects on the rest of the planet. So it is about research and education that I was mentioning earlier. And here specifically, we're talking about, for example, interdisciplinarity in research and education, because it brings together the expertise of natural sciences, of social sciences and humanities. And interdisciplinarity is already an established pillar of university research, education and innovation and it can really enable the needed holistic thinking. Finally, it is about drivers such as student demands and engagement with local communities that are no less meaningful for climate actions than regulations, for example, or targets for specific sectors. The current uh, early stage in developing the Green Deal is really the ideal moment to seize the opportunity and address detrimental assumptions that only some actors and some knowledge can support this political uh, framework. So the expertise of universities is really essential to open up routes to success. Universities produce new insights into values, norms and processes that ensure justice and fairness in achieving sustainability. The ability of universities to bring together expertise from different areas can be used as a model to realize a, system, a systemic approach throughout the European Union. Additionally, it can make policies and their implementation more attuned to the very complex uh, behavioral changes, the social acceptance and the influence of value and belief system that social sciences and humanities, which I was mentioning, can focus on. A further aspect of the Green Deal that needs to be refined, as I mentioned also earlier, is how the political ambitions are informed by scientific data. The parameters within um, uh, which, uh, which such change is both feasible and time, timely stem from an assortment of factors like, for example, culture and local specificities, but also governance structures or the configuration of energy system, which can vary a lot. Uh, across countries. So while it is evident that collecting and analyzing this data will not be impactful if done in isolation, integrating, uh, integrating it all uh, as part of a systemic solution to the climate emergency remains challenging in the absence of a holistic approach. Finally, universities play a key role in the innovation pipeline from research to industry and in connecting academia and society through education. They innovate to answer demands and they adapt with challenge-based learning and teaching, uh, for example. With this response to the Green Deal, the EUA is articulating its position on how to improve the policy framework using universities' core areas of expertise, research, education, and innovation. Policymakers need to recognize universities as critical stakeholders in the Green Deal. We have several recommendations to national and European policymakers to open up the university uh, and to enable an effective co creation of the Green Deal. First, policies and funding programs must support interdisciplinary research and education and turn them into core enablers of Europe's sustainability agenda. Second, 
a synergetic vision is required to further boost Horizon Europe in Erasmus Plus and expand the use of innovative methods like challenge-based learning and living labs. Three, a balanced mix must be ensured between basic research and more mission-driven approaches. Four, working at the science policy interface and offering support to local communities must be incentivized by reforming academic career assessment. Five, policymakers must partner with universities to develop and implement new thinking around sustainable well-being, which is central to a holistic transition. And then finally, number six, the EU must see constructive partnerships between the global north and global south and tap into the many international and cross-sectoral alliances which universities already play a key role in. So these are the six recommendations, and I don't have the time to go into full details. They're all actually in the position that we're publishing today, and which you can find already in the handouts, if you wish. I'll conclude with, indeed, a, a few conclusions. Because decision makers must recognize, as I mentioned already several times, and I think that's a key message, they must recognize that the university sector is a critical stakeholder that can help foster impactful narrative, for example, for citizens' mobilization and avoid the fragmentation of policies across different domains. So, as I said before, scientific insight does not stop at the point of informing regulations or shaping policy proposals. Europe's commitment to climate neutrality requires a Green Deal that is evidence-based, that is holistic, with the strong involvement of universities in its co-creation. With that, I think it's time to move on. Today, of course, as I mentioned, we're publishing our EUA position, a university vision for the European Green Deal. And again, you can have that available in the handouts. I'd like to announce also the creation, actually, of an EUA task and finish group that will be dedicated to the Green Deal. So this is also starting today, and very soon there will be a launch for uh, the call for experts to our national rectors' conferences. But really, today is about a webinar. And uh, beyond me presenting to you uh, the uh, EUA position, I would like to... Uh, actually, could I, could I have the, the slide back, please? I would like to uh, be quickly able to introduce, actually, uh, the webinar today. Because first, we're going to have Chris Foltz, uh, who is a member of the uh, EUA Energy and Environment Platform, but also an associate professor at Anglia Ruskin University. And he will be showcasing a university contribution to the Green Deal. After that, we're going to have a panel discussion that's moderated by Douglas Halliday, who I presented already. And we will have also with us today uh, Kathy McGuire from the European Environment Agency, as well as uh, Simone uh, Taglipietra, who's a senior fellow at uh, Burgle, but also an adjunct professor at the Catholic University of Milan. And fortunately, uh, today, Ivanka Popovich fell ill to COVID this morning and was unwell. Uh, Chris Fall has very kindly accepted to uh, jump in uh, and take her place. So thank you very much to Chris. Thank you to Kathy as well as to Simone. Uh, and now I would like to, before handing over to Douglas, uh, launch one more poll. And that is, um, the question is actually, do you feel that the Green Deal reflects universities' expertise? So we'd like to know if, if you feel that the Green Deal reflects universities' expertise. So there you go, answers are starting to come in. going up. Ooh, it's balanced. A lot of pe people are wondering, partly, but actually we are at 30%. So people are quite unsure. A lot of partly and then a good split between the yes and the no there. Numbers are going up, but it's staying quite stable. Unknown. Well, I think, I think Douglas, this is a good time then for you to start thinking about that for later, huh? And in the meantime, we're going to go to Chris. Chris, welcome. Thank you so much for, uh, for coming to this webinar and to really giving us an example, a showcase of what's happening 
uh, at, un at university. So thank you so much for being here and I hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. And yes, um, just to kick off by saying I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed working with you, Wayne, in the last couple of years on this with, with Douglas and team. And uh, yeah, you're clearly leading the way in, in, um, in all of this space. So great to have this webinar today and to be able to, to contribute a little bit to that. So um, in the next 10 minutes or so, I'm hoping to uh, showcase uh, a university contribution based upon the coordination of some Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe projects uh, that we've led and how they connect to, to the EU Green Deal. Um, so um, two main threads, two main messages, uh, which I want to begin and finish with, um, which I hope will come very obvious very quickly through almost everything that I'm talking about, um, but just to reiterate from the start too, <clears throat> that the EU Green Deal is not just about technologies, uh, this has already been mentioned uh, by Stefan, um, but of course that universities can uh, do a lot, they, they should do a lot, and indeed they are doing a lot to influence the EU Green Deal policy making landscape already. And of course, I'll lean on some of my examples that I'll refer to in a moment to do with the social sciences and humanities. And in fact, I put them in red just here because um, given how much I refer to SSH in the presentation, I just wanted to pause briefly to say what, what I see them as being. So, I mean, the social sciences to me would include things like uh, human geography, sociology, psychology. It's all to do with understanding human action and why we do what we do and how we may influence that. Immediately, you can see that that could be quite helpful uh, if you're trying to tackle the Green Deal. On, for the humanities, the, I think these are like the, the bigger questions around where we want to go as societies. Uh, so, you know, what's fair, what's just, um, inequities, inequalities, roles of gender, faith, religion. And this would then pull up on disciplines such as theology, um, history, um, ph philosophy and these sorts of things. So yes, ju just to sort of say that these are the sorts of ideas and the projects that, that I'll sort of be referring to. And in terms of the Green Deal, you can immediately see how those sorts of things are immediately relevant. Going back to the, the Green Deal communication, it, this may even be on page one, if, if not page one, very early in it. Uh, this is a quote directly from the communications, where it says that the Green Deal will put people first. So, And it also raises things like justice, inclusivity, public participation, diversity, citizens. It talks about engagement with the local authorities, civil society, industry. You know, you can immediately see how social sciences and humanities are really embedded within this and it's really not just a technological problem um, and so all of these points that EUA have raised around interdisciplinarity are in my view absolutely central. Okay so just um, referring back to some of the projects and to contextualize where some of my views are coming from uh, these four projects we've we've coordinated in, in recent years or we're soon to um, shape energy and energy shifts. We work closely with the European Commission uh, DG for Research and Innovation around how energy funding may want to evolve to better account for energy and climate change targets, obviously now um, ingrained within Green Deal um, programs. Uh, the shared Green Deal um, project started last month. This is a major five million pound five year project with a commitment to run a, a network for three years post project. So really it's for the, all of the 2020s. And this is firmly around social sciences and humanities and trying to embed local and regional sort of city based change in partnership with NGOs and municipalities across all of Europe, across all of the Green Deal policy areas. Um, I have a slide later on where I talk about a, a few things with regard to that. But uh, this is something that as I say that started last month and uh, we're really excited to get going on that. And then finally, something that I don't really refer to, but we were lucky enough to find out recently, uh, we are, um, we've recently been awarded uh, the SSH Centre, this is Horizon Europe project running for three years, um, and hopefully September onwards, and this is the EU the EU Centre of Excellence for Social Science and Humanities on Climate, Energy and Mobility. So again, really central to trying to bridge research and policy interests in these areas uh, to the Commission. And across all these projects, I just wanted to sort of dwell on a few a few threads that, that we like to, to ensure that we have, as I think it sort of resonates with what universities have to offer. 
And firstly, um, really important to me is the role of existing evidence. I think quite often when we talk about university contributions, we're drawn to sort of new investments and new possibilities, whereas actually there's decades amount of fantastic work that can be drawn upon, you know, ready-made insights to either unpack, you know, the unintended consequences, the ground level experiences um, of policy interventions or to help us design better policy interventions but either way there's there's a lot there that we can draw and we should draw upon and some of our um, sort of policy accessible literature review reports you know on things here like energy and gender uh, perhaps you can't see them because they're a bit small or you know energy justice and the things I think hit at the heart of this and in terms of future research priorities I've, I firmly sort of feel that a pragmatic approach is useful here. So on the one hand, we have the, the SSH crowd that really want to stick loyally to their, their theories, concepts and ideas, understandably so. And then on the other side, we have the policymakers that really want to drive their, um, their policy interests and their objectives. Um, but I think there's a conversation to be had where they can they can meet in the middle. And this is something that we did with these 100 research questions on different um, topics. So we've got something on, you know, uh, transport mobility, energy efficiency and different different topics where we where we've got 400 over 400 uh, Euro European researchers involved to really say, well, if we want to stay loyal to some of our SSH ideas, what do we think should be funded if we actually still want to drive forward, for instance, Green Deal research objectives? Um, and I think that's a really interesting conversation to have to try and be pragmatic from the start and think, well, where do universities where can universities come together with policymakers to get something that both sides are happy with? And yes, uh, across the projects, we've always been uh, clear to uh, have some sort of tangible policy recommendations. Um, the 10 recommendations on the left here, um, I put in the handout section. I'm not sure if you know how to navigate to that, but if not, perhaps EUA colleagues could signpost how to, how to reach that in the chat. We've also done various other things like running fellowships, for instance, where we've asked those in industry or those in policy positions to pose a, a real world problem, if you like, and then we work with them to connect them to SSH experts that can give them the sort of the, the social science expertise to help solve their real world problem. So this, this is something we're really interested in. Um, and, and just sort of a quick example to sort of, um, I suppose, show some of these possibilities a bit more. And to emphasize here that we are definitely not the only people operating this space. Um, for instance, EUA, people within the Commission, other organisations are all working, I think, in the same direction. And, and I think that's only, only for the good. Um, but we've, through some of our work, hoped to influence EU research innovation policy on low carbon energy, um, which, of course, is, is central interest to universities in general, I think. Um, but for instance, we've, we've, we've uh, I suppose, been a beacon of best practice, as we've been told, for why it's important to mainstream, so think of and embed SSH within um, Horizon Europe and for that Horizon 2020 uh, research projects. And we've worked with um, executive agencies on how to evaluate uh, technical projects to think about how they should account for SSH, you know, in terms of interdisciplinary potential. We've worked with member state bodies at the, the set plan and strategic energy technology plan level, as well as uh, individual member state delegations. Um, we've also got involved with uh, trying to help the Commission on the writing of funding calls to get the most out of SSH and to drive interdisciplinary potential as most, uh, most as possible within within pillar two of um, their, their framework programs. And it's something that we really enjoyed doing. I mentioned earlier about this new shared Green Deal project, um, and I, I just flag it here to sort of emphasize that I think universities have the responsibility to and the, the clear access to, 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 to access the different multi, the multiple levels of governance. So it's not just about European policy landscapes, but about what sits beneath that. And so, for instance, with this shared Green Deal project, we're connecting with, with many local, uh, we're running 24 and funding 24 what we're calling local experiments, so sort of ground level novel engagement programs with municipalities and grassroots NGOs. And this is across all of the, the Green Deal policy areas. And then the hope is that those local lessons can be scaled up uh, to have significance at the European level, for instance, through a network that we're hoping to run with the Commission. 
and we have commitment to run post project. So um, as I round up um, with a bit of a whistle stop tour on, on some of my thoughts, I wanted to finish with some takeaways um, for universities in my mind for how to engage with policy actors. So to start with, if this interests you or what I've been talking about and you're wanting to engage with SSH more within your projects or your research more generally, great. Um, but I would add a, a note of caution in that I don't think that everyone can necessarily do SSH in the same way that I wouldn't go into a natural science laboratory and fiddle around with equipment I don't understand. There are sort of robust methodologies. Um, so, you know, if you're interested in SSH, the best thing I would encourage you to do is to get in touch with an SSH expert. Also, perhaps, um, you know, th there's certain skill sets around engaging research and policy. And I'd certainly encourage people to Google, for instance, something on like boundary spanning, because there's there's a, a literature out there that talks about skill sets and personalities for how, how to connect these worlds. And hopefully I've made clear that um, there's different ways to engage policy actors in many different forms. And in doing this, I don't think it's necessarily just fruitful to engage the traditional policy makers. So, you know, the civil servants or the elected officials, but actually all those involved in surrounding and shaping policies, whether it's lobby groups, think tanks, NGOs, the likes of EUA, other university associations. These are all really important groups. And I think it's sort of moving away from government policy to wider ideas of governance are useful. So in this way, coalitions of having different stakeholders and multiple angles are really fruitful. And I think universities are, are uniquely positioned to work across scales. You know, they're locally situated, they're internationally relevant. And so I think it's important to, to work with, for instance, the commission or the target group and not just work for them. And it's hard to perhaps communicate in, in a, a, sort of a presentation like this, but I think it's really fun as well to, to sort of get your hands dirty and to try and try and get some impact and to affect, for instance, the Green Deal. Um, and because of this, I would really challenge this binary assumption that you can't have impact and you can't drive change if you're interested in research, because actually you can do both at the same time. You can do research through your engagement and your impact activities. So um, I finish with the messages that I started on, which hopefully I've made clear. And I, I certainly thank EUA for the opportunity to speak here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Wonderful. I'll, I'll let you catch your breath. Well, probably I start with the Q&A and take personally the first question. Um, we have one question here coming from Lena, Lena Christensen. Uh, first, she says, really good messaging, many thanks. Well, very happy that uh, it helped, it's useful. The question is, do you also link the position to the midterm evaluation of Horizon Europe in line with the focus on industry? We unfortunately see increased TRL levels in pillar two, which is really a pity, uh, as incremental collaborate, collaborative research should also be at the heart of the Green Deal contribution from the universities. Well, uh, to answer your question, Lena, what I'd like to say is that, well, we haven't waited for the midterm review. Uh, be it in the uh, publication we did last year on ERA or indeed what we had published previously on Horizon Europe. We keep on ha hammering and uh, letting the Commission know as soon as we, you know, as much as we can, that there needs to be a proper balance indeed between the basic research and the more mission driven uh, type of research. So we insist on this all the time, and I do expect that indeed this will also come out uh, of the, uh, you know, uh, what we will uh, uh, publish on the midterm review. So definitely something we are aware of, and that's why, for example, in the recommendations that you see on this uh, EUA position on, on the Green Deal, we also talk about basic research and mission-driven research and the right ba balance need, needed to be, uh, to, be, uh, to be struck there. So that's uh, for answering that question. Uh, I yes, Chris. Could I can I come in on that question as well? Is of that course, all right? Of course. Yes, great. Thank thank you. Um, yes, just a, a couple of immediate thoughts. Uh, you're right in my my sense and to what I've heard from the commission as well is that there does seem to be an increasing reliance on TRLs. Uh, from what I've also heard um, is that within the development of future work programs within Horizon Europe, there's also talk around uh, societal readiness levels, SRLs, they're trying to sort of push them slightly, um, but I think they're still fairly technologically grounded. So perhaps fall with the same 
the yeah, pitfalls that TRLs do. The other thing as well that um, I've heard just in terms of the next stage of Horizon Europe, which I personally feel, if, if, it, if it is true, it would, would be a real shame, is that um, in terms of pushing um, interdisciplinary disciplinary interests they are relying on mainstreaming of ssh so having uh, so which is good in itself but to the detriment of dedicated ssh calls where they're looking at interdisciplinarity within ssh which they have done within some of the pillars for a few years now but uh, i think that that space is getting squeezed and they're trying to sort of tick the ssh box uh, through well it's covered everywhere it's being mainstreamed um and i think part of us working in this space would wonder how effective uh interdisciplinary working and, and ssh integration into technical projects is going so I, I suppose maybe it's coming back to this point of if if uh, ssh dedicated calls are being sort of sidelined a bit more then the the call for us in universities to make sure we're getting interdisciplinary interdisciplinarity right is even more important because that really is the the space that uh, the commission are, are um, really pushing on. Thanks a lot, Chris. And, and, and just to continue quickly, there's another question by Tenzing Yundung, uh, still on Horizon Europe and the recommendation around Horizon Europe and Erasmus Plus. Uh, I don't want to take away too much time from the panel discussion and, and from handing over to Douglas. So what I would urge you to do is that there is further information uh, you're asked to elaborate on that uh, recommendation. It is in the uh, position paper. So you're welcome to go either on the EUA website or in the handouts here, and you will see further information uh, on, on that specifically. So uh, given that uh, you, Chris, are going to be in the panel, I don't feel so bad to shorten the Q&A now to be able to uh, hand over to Douglas, to uh, Kathy, Simone, and yourself, actually, and turn, turn off my camera. Uh, Douglas, thank you very much for the position, for chairing the uh, EUA Energy and Environment Platform, and uh, very much looking forward to uh, this panel now uh, that you're going to be chairing. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Stefan, for that introduction and for that welcome. Um, my name is Douglas Halliday. I'm based in Durham University in the UK. Um, and for the last three years, I've been chair of the EUA Energy and Environment Platform, uh, leading the group that has developed and put together this position paper, which I'm encouraging everyone to download from the, the handout section and what we will be discussing today. So just before I introduce uh, members of the panel, let me fully endorse what Stefan said at the very start of this webinar today. EU European solidarity is a key strategic objective of EUA. And it's very clear that at this time, you know, we need to stand firm in terms of promoting and representing the values that we all hold to be true and dear to ourselves, not only in terms of, you know, the geopolitical factors we're seeing playing out in Eastern Europe, but also actually in the context of the Green Deal. The Green Deal is a global problem, not just a, a European problem, and we need to be open, um, accountable, transparent, and have the ability to work with researchers from right across um, our globe to make a successful outcome. So having said that, let me welcome the members of the panel. They've already been introduced to you today. So we have um, Cathy from the... Um, European Environment Agency, we have Simone from the Catholic University of Milan, and we have Chris Folds from Anglia Ruskin University in the UK. So I'd like to invite each of those in turn to make a few opening comments um, about the topic of discussion today, and then following that we'll have a, a discussion and I will be setting some questions to the panel members. So Cathy, let me first of all invite you to make your preliminary comments. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Douglas. Um, now, reading the position paper, I thought there were a lot of important issues within there, but obviously with five minutes, I just want to focus on a, on a few points because the rest will come out in the discussion. The first was really around what knowledge. Um, the paper, maybe because of where it came from, the paper really puts a lot of emphasis on climate change. 
but our sustainability challenges are much broader. We've got climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution, driven by unsustainable resource use, resulting in health impacts and exacerbation of inequalities. And we know that these issues are really interlinked, so trying to tackle one in isolation won't work because some of them, they share multiple causes and they share similar solutions. And the paper also highlights a few areas of knowledge needs, including knowledge and action for climate goals, sustainable well-being, and really Europe in this global context. Now, the EEA published a report, Knowledge for Action, in October last year, and I put it up in the handout section. And in it, we systematically went through the policy areas of the European Green Deal, looking at what the knowledge needs were for policy support and for both Green Deal areas and the related policy domains. And it mirrored some of the stuff in, in your paper, but obviously goes much broader than that. But one thing is a lot of this is not new and knowledge gaps are not always the barrier to action. And this assumption that more knowledge results in better policies leads to improvement in environmental outcomes really doesn't reflect um, real world experience. So we then turned our focus much more into how knowledge is developed, taken up and used rather than focusing on, on what knowledge. Now, both in the Green Deal and the forthcoming Aid Environmental Action Programme, knowledge is seen as a key enabler of sustainability transitions. And in our Knowledge for Action report, we use Kuhn's kind of structure of scientific revolutions as a bit of a framing to argue that we've seen a bit of a paradigm shift in our understanding of environmental challenges to one that is now shows environmental is environment is inextricably linked to sustainability challenges. Um, we've also seen a bit of a shift in the policy paradigm with the Green Deal and AAP. So there's sustainability goals and the need for transformative change more at the heart of EU policy. But again, when we look at, at knowledge, while the dominant paradigm has evolved over time, there's still a lot of an element of the core is business as usual. So we need to ask the question, do we also need a new a paradigm shift to a new knowledge system to address these challenges? And so what do we mean by a knowledge system? Um, for us, we define it as kind of the institutions, actors, structures, mindsets, values and cultures that affect what knowledge is produced, how it's produced, and then how it's taken up and communicated. And so a critical question is, can we transform the current knowledge system to support these societal transitions processes? at the scale and urgency that's needed. And we know our current system has limitations such as being fragmented, compartmentalized, mostly focusing on problems rather than solutions and kind of disconnected from action. And the current knowledge system has mostly supported incremental changes rather than the whole systemic transformation that's called for in the European Green Deal to really tackle sustainability challenges. And different, different visions of knowledge systems have been developed, but they have some common themes, you know, that these future systems should be more collaborative, open, diverse, egalitarian, uh, better able to work with values and systemic issues, where the goal of the system might change from creating knowledge about the world to creating knowledge about the world and then how to act appropriately to tackle these challenges. And in our Knowledge for Action report, we put forward some initial ideas around this future knowledge system for sustainability in terms of the areas for action, the key actors, what the system features could be and the outcomes. And this, along with many others, have identified the need for more integrated knowledge, collaborative practices and more effective science, science, science society policy interfaces, all issues that you pick up in your position paper and identify as important. And that's why I think it's worth thinking about them in the context of a knowledge system, because we are part of that system, both universities and boundary organizations like EEA, and we shape that system. So we would very much support your view of universities as critical actors um, that go way beyond service providers, or way well beyond service providers. And when it comes to supporting more interdisciplinary research, experimentation, greater engagement with policymakers and citizens. I mean, I would fully agree that this needs to be supported by change, both from the policy and funding side, as well as the current incentive and reward structure in academia and higher education. There needs to be change across the board. I mean, and we all want knowledge to lead to change. And when we talk about actionable knowledge, this means knowledge that is relevant, understandable, that links to these sustainability challenges and policy ambitions. And it also incorporates an understanding of both 
policy making and political decision making. So I was one thing that I was struck by in the paper was it where it talks about policy being science driven. Now at EA we would always talk more about policy being science informed because evidence is a very important consideration, but it's never the sole basis for decision making. And when it comes to these more complex sustainability challenges, there are always multiple objectives and inevitable trade-offs that have to be addressed. So these become societal choices, which and, and often about balancing trade-offs, which means when you're providing knowledge that supports policy process, transparency about uncertainties, ambiguities, tensions, weaknesses is absolutely vital. And I think this issue is also one that relates to a very practical one of what competencies and um, capacities are needed to do more interdisciplinary work and engaging with policymakers and citizens. And we look a bit at this in, in, in our work, and when we talk about competences, I mean, this encompasses knowledge, but also skills and attitude, and often a lot more attention is paid to the knowledge rather than skills and attitudes, because we often need skills such as facilitation and things to do this type of work, which are not normally part of scientist training. And the Joint Research Centre has done some really nice work on what sustainability competence are and created a framework, which I think is useful for both people on the research side as well as the policy side, because it's going to take action on both. And again, I've put that up in the handouts. So in conclusion, I mean, in an ideal knowledge system, we would say the development, uptake and use of knowledge would be an iterative, holistic co-creation process involving a broad range of actors, like universities being one of them, organizations like ourselves being another. But if we think about how to shape this future system, it really requires us to start by reflecting on our own role and how we can contribute to it. And I think the position paper that you've developed certainly starts the process of doing that. Thank you. Well, Cathy, thank you very much for your thoughts. We'll come back to some of those um, ideas when we come to have our discussion later on in the panel. So now I'd like to move to Simone and invite him to offer his preliminary comments. So Simone, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, congratulations uh, for this position paper that uh, indeed raises, in my view, a very important uh, question. And uh, I shared the initial assessment about the the, the need to uh, really uh, make uh, more and more clear the important role that uh, universities and overall the epistemic community can play in shaping the policies of the European Green Deal and their implementation. I think uh, this is particularly important because the European Green Deal uh, is, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, not only a techno technological uh, challenge, but really a socioeconomic uh, challenge. This is what decarbonization is. Uh, we are facing uh, really an industrial revolution against a deadline. We have uh, a short period of time ahead of us to deliver on this decarbonization process. And uh, this will profoundly and quickly reshape our economies. As such, uh, there will be no single, single sector of our economy which will not be touched by this process. And that's exactly the reason why we are in, in need of uh, uh, developing new thinking for such an historical challenge. And I think uh, the, uh, the idea of policymakers partnering more with universities to uh, develop and implement uh, new thinking on sustainable development is very important also because we can easily uh, see and understand that uh, while policymakers might be very busy on their day by day uh, tasks and commitments, uh, uh, it might be more challenging uh, for institutions to develop a more long-term strategic thinking. And that's where I think universities and think tanks as well have a very important role to, to play. I think uh, uh, the um, another point in the paper that I particularly appreciated is the global dimension and this idea of uh, the global north and south collaboration. That's, I think, very, very important because uh, the green transition doesn't happen uh, in, uh, in, uh, you know, in silos. It's not independent from many other trends we are already uh, seeing uh, coming out of, of the European Commission itself and in general uh, of Europe. And 
one of that is certainly to uh, to have a more impactful role in the world and uh, one of the initiatives uh, that uh, are being promoted for that purpose is the global gateway initiative no of the european commission to make sure that uh, the european action in developing countries etc is more impactful and there i think uh, uh, it is increasingly clear also from the development policy circles that uh, uh, funding development aid is not sufficient alone you need capacity building, you, you need training activities, you need to build partnerships, full-fledged partnerships. And that's where also I think uh, this very important point of the collaboration between uh, our universities, universities in the global south, can be very, very important and impactful for the green transition overall. And let's recall here that... Uh, uh, Europe only matters for 8% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. So bringing the European Green Deal beyond the European borders is particularly important if we really want to make a difference. And therefore, this aspect, in my view, is very important. Then, and I will conclude, I think uh, I will slightly disagree with the, with the points that are made uh, in the paper on growth. Uh, I think... Uh, uh, okay, there is a big debate out there about the growth and green growth. I would tend to sit on the green growth uh, side here. I think growth is an imperative. Politically, the growth is unviable. And in any case, I think uh, uh, growth itself is not responsible for inequalities. We need to make sure that uh, we have a new growth model that is sustainable and more equitable. That's what I think we need to aim for. And again, the, the idea of green growth, which is indeed the paradigm on which the European Green Deal has been built by the Commission, I think uh, uh, is predominantly structured on a positive uh, view on what can be achieved also with technological development. No? We see major cost reductions in the technologies from solar to wind energy, replicating this success to all the other technologies we need to unleash the green transformation is the key to really decouple emissions from economic activities. I think uh, this is just uh, uh, stressing more and more the important role of technology, but also the important role of research. So I think research is actually one of the key pillars of, uh, of the green growth view that uh, the European Commission is uh, proposing. And that's where I think the two recommendations that are also included in the paper are very valid. So on the one hand, we need to make sure to spend more for research. On the other hand, we also need to make sure we spend better. And there it is very important. I very much agree with the point. We need a balanced mix between no, the basic research and the more mission-driven approaches. We need a strong Horizon Europe, but we also need, in my view, a stronger European Innovation Council, for example. We need a stronger uh, funding that goes to uh, disruptive innovators in order to make sure that also Europe is able, like the United States, to be well-positioned on the frontier of research, so the breakthrough innovation we need in order to unleash this transformation. I think uh, this is one of the, of the points that can be seen also in the paper, and uh, I think I very much agree with all these, and again, congratulations for this excellent work. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Simone, for your contribution. I'm sure we'll come back to the questions uh, you raised about growth later on. So now I'd like to move to Chris and once again, thank him for stepping in to fill the missing place on this panel at the last minute. But Chris, would you like to give us your preliminary comments and thoughts? Thank you. Thanks so much. Yes. Um, so I thought that it, uh, in, in, my, in my five minutes allocated here, I thought it would be useful to briefly comment on the aims and then zoom in into uh, one, one, one component mainly to do with uh, the calls for interdisciplinarity and about how, I mean, there's, there's one or two dedicated recommendations, but it also is kind of threaded through many of the others too. So in terms of the aims, um, just to sort of, I suppose, fully advocate and endorse um, what it's trying to do. So, I mean, the, the quotes that I've got here, to, to recognize universities as the critical stakeholders in the Green Deal. Yes, I completely agree with that. I think universities have the ability to work across scales, to, pass, to, to span perspectives and, and disciplines, to connect with networks and often give a voice to many that wouldn't normally have a voice if things are done well. Obviously, we all we'll know that, um, 
that universities can fall into the same traps of, um, you know, falling into the ivory tower mentality and 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 and, and not giving the, the voice to the marginalised. But I feel like it has a lot of potential to do that. Um, and then an another one sort of within within the position paper says that a. Uh, uh, that it will show that close interaction with universities can unlock problem solving capabilities. And indeed, I mean, as, as I just mentioned, I think that has clear potential, particularly if the forms of interdisciplinarity are sort of more problem centered. Uh, Stefan's already mentioned um, the possibility of sort of leaning or towards or at least always having some mission orientated research and obviously that would help with it um, and just with that aim i suppose i would additionally add that it, perhaps it's it's not just closer in interaction with universities but between universities too um, before i sort of zoom into to the interdisciplinarity I, I i definitely have to make a comment or two about um the, the previous the previous speaker's great comments in particular kathy's comments around politics and subjectivities and institutional setups as well that, that was mentioned um I, th I think these are really important um and i mean there's obviously a big push for evidence-based policy making which of course you know is important but at the same time it's a bit of a fallacy and you know there's there's a certain amount of policy-based evidence making that's going on um, as indeed is the nature of these framework programs so I think we need to be quite reflective around the sorts of evidence that's being created and do you know what I mean like if if we're basing our evidence on driving policy but the creation of that evidence comes from policy you're just in this loop of hearing the same sorts of evidence and the same sorts of ideas and maybe you know trying to disrupt that cycle is no bad thing in terms of interdisciplinarity, um, and just to sort of be completely upfront, the reason why I've zoomed in on this, um, we, we published a, a, an open access book, actually, I've just put the link into the chat at the end of last year, which looked at the ground level experiences of doing interdisciplinarity within large scale, often um, consortium based energy projects, um, and what the implications were and the influences. So, you know, the, the funding institutions, how they led to certain experiences on the ground and all of these sorts of things, which I think, which I think resonate with some of what we're talking about. Um, but in terms of interdisciplinarity, I, I, I would wholly agree with the aims of the position paper um, and say as well that, um, that the interdisciplinarity exists both across the STEM, the technical and natural sciences, and then the SSH, as well as within the STEM and within the SSH. I don't necessarily feel that we always need to assume interdisciplinarity is across the sort of the social and the non-social divide. And I think that's that's totally fine too. In terms of how to actively support that, um, I mean, I've already talked around how, you know, SSH mainstreaming is important. Um, but I think also it's important to move beyond a tick box, a tick box mentality in, in terms of achieving these sorts of things. And for instance, assuming that the SSH box is ticked if economics is included. Economics is a bit of a disputed SSH discipline anyway. Um, but regardless of if you agree or not with that, going towards the same sort of discipline when you're trying to get interdisciplinarity moving I don't think it's going to be helpful if we're just doing the same sorts of things each time and I think we need to be sensitive and perhaps this is what Kathy was maybe implying too around how funding systems and institutional setups are sort of obstructing progress um, and are, are actually halting or at least inhibiting certain disciplinary integration so um, I, some examples I, I put down here that you know the way that the um, the funding call texts are written or the makeup of evaluation panels or the monitoring of um, project delivery post funding you know do they deliver on their interdisciplinary promises what are the templates and applications like you know all of these things which really lock people into certain possibilities um, and i think actually will affect if you know the eua vision can become reality i think i think that can come down to these sorts of things um Maybe I'll just finish with with one with one um, comment on on this um, as I'm conscious of time. I, I I do I do believe that different forms of interdisciplinarity are needed, as as I've sort of already mentioned. And so I I did also like in the position paper how they talk about a balanced mix between basic research, you know, the fundamentals, and the mission driven approaches. I think that's really important. Um, and and then uh, to, I suppose to finish with the note of caution that. Um, sort of you know 
being slightly instrumental or normative, as us social scientists would say, around um, mission-driven approaches uh, it can be really useful. But we need to be really reflexive around how that mission is constructed and how the problems are defined and who is setting the direction of these approaches. Because otherwise, you're sort of saying oh, mission-driven approaches are great, but are they actually achieving what they ever set out to do in terms of, you know, getting the universities to, to drive research innovation for the good of society, it comes down to, 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 to the, how the problems are defined and who's involved. So there we go. Thank you. Well, Chris, thank you very much for your comments. And we'll come back to some of that in the questions. So we've now got about 15 minutes or so for a, a discussion in, in a small group and panel. And I think what I'd like to do is maybe pick one or two key highlights that each of you offered in your introductory comments and maybe have a, a quick sort of discussion and, and question of, uh, around those ideas and concepts. So, Cathy, as you went first, I'll return to you. So, you know, one of the things that you were talking about was advocating this idea of new frameworks and new structures, new approaches for developing knowledge and the link to education and training. And, you know, thinking about EUA members that might be listening on the webinar, what sort of ideas, what sort of approaches, what sort of frameworks do you think they should be considering in terms of developing the kind of new approach that you are advocating? Well, I mean, at, at its core is basically for, you know, one of the roles that AEA, AEA has is to do these policy relevant assessments. And so for the last decade, we've been emphasizing this need to bring in much more systems thinking into policy and try to have these more transformative policy frameworks. And you see this playing out now in European policy with you know, things focus on the food system, mobility system, recognizing that it's not just about, about a sector, but we need to take a much a different way of thinking. And we would also argue that we need to apply this to knowledge in the same way. Um, and we, you know, so it means think, if we think about frameworks, I mean, we, we have things that are focused on research, things that are focused on innovation, et cetera, but what we don't really have is like a knowledge strategy for Europe that actually takes steps back and looks and says, well, what, if we think about these sustainability challenges and we think about the, this role that knowledge is supposed to play, what and how are, should we be doing that? And how do we have coherence between all these different initiatives? So in the same way that we try to think about that in, in policy domains, I think we should also be thinking about that in terms of the various components of a knowledge system. I mean, that can seem quite kind of removed and, and conceptual so there are some very practical things that can be done that's why i would refer to things like the jrc's work on their enlightenment 2.0 program about how do we do this knowledge development that supports policy in a world which you know we would call VUCA with a lot more volatility ambiguity complexity uncertainty because you know the, the context is different and that means that you know we need to address that in, in how we do knowledge and so then that can be from things like that to you know the very practical things about well what does that to do effective work in this way what does it mean for the types of skills and competences and how can we bring that into how we train people and the types of projects that the people get engaged in um so i mean we don't have the answers for this, I don't think anybody has. But what we wanted to do was start the start a conversation and start a discussion because there has been things, and you know, we've engaged in it a bit in in research projects here and there, but not collectively, and certainly not with our other partners like in the EU, who would be seen as the people basically provide you know developing the knowledge base that supports these policy developments and discussions. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. And I mean, Simone, sort of picking up on that, have you got any examples or uh, possible approaches that connect to that at your institution, thinking this idea of how we might realign the way that universities are custodians of knowledge, what the knowledge is and what the purpose of that knowledge is? Well, I think that uh, um, one of the major policy um, developments that uh, we have been seeing uh, in this space uh, over the last uh, uh, couple of years is uh, to move beyond uh, the traditional uh, uh, silos uh, uh, policy making. So we used to have uh, 
different uh, policies, energy, climate, uh, environmental, um, social policy, macroeconomics, etc., being dealt by different people in different compartments, basically. And uh, uh, the EU made uh, an attempt uh, to try to do uh, some uh, silos abatement uh, already with the Energy Union initiative under the previous commission. But the European Green Deal now really wants to to foster synergies and try to have an holistic approach to policy making in this space, uh, given that uh, the uh, the order of magnitude of the challenge we have to tackle is uh, very vast. So the European Green Deal itself, but also the creation, if you think about of the post of uh, first vice president for the European Green Deal, I mean, all these was done by, by, by Ursula von der Leyen to try to combine different policy areas together and really try to move the European decarbonization process uh, using all the policy uh, tools we have at our disposal in a coherent manner. Mm -hmm. This is, of course, uh, uh, challenging from an institutional perspective because you need to have different departments talking to each other more than the regular inter-service consultation. But it is also challenging from a more uh, intellectual perspective because you need to find uh, also new solutions that bring together different kind of policies so let me go back to the example i made before about the global gateway that's a way that europe is trying to adopt uh, to revolutionize its external funding for development in a way to have it done uh, for multiple policy purposes mm -hmm. development foreign policy industrial policy as well. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly how, for example, Europe should tackle industrial policy. So uh, one view that also with a colleague uh, we have been promoting over the last couple of years uh, with Rémi de Wegelers uh, at Bruegel is this idea of industrial policy as a triple concentric circles. No, you start with research, innovation, you make sure to have the disruptive innovation, but then you need also to have an internal market in Europe that uh, is able to deploy these uh, uh, innovative products, uh, innovative green products. So you need also standards and rules, public procurement, very important. And then you need to export. So you need also this kind of uh, uh, guarantees, uh, blended finance tools to make sure that the European companies can go beyond Europe to, uh, to sell these products. So this kind of uh, new interactions between policy areas is where I think uh, universities can really provide uh, a very important contribution because it is about thinking something that doesn't exist so far. And therefore, we need also a good degree of creativity and really show that uh, what could be potential way forward to policymakers, uh, way forward that might be not explored before, and therefore there is a big deal of innovation here to be brought into the into the conversation. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I mean, Chris, in, on sort of linked to this, you spend a lot of time thinking about what you call interdisciplinarity and bringing together these different perspectives from the sort of technical, engineering, scientific social science humanities viewpoints. I mean, what would you say to people who are thinking about how they might try and take some steps to build on what they're doing or to develop new approaches and new ideas? What would you be looking for there? Um, well, certainly I would, if, if they were wanting to take it really seriously, I would say that, you know, at the concept stage, like uh, before too many decisions have been decided about the, whether it's research, teaching, or impact activities, before that's uh, really before there's been much momentum built to get uh, the right people in place, so that I suppose the the concept that the, the, the common problem is defined with everyone around the table. Because I think what often happens is that a certain viewpoint dominates before people are even invited in to collaborate, and then actually it suffers down the line because there isn't a shared ownership, um, a shared conceptualization of the problem. But as well as that, I think it's important to, um, to not 
necessarily be overly ambitious like there doesn't need to be a theory of everything that needs to be thought of there doesn't necessarily need to be like uh, uh, amazing theorized ideas concepts embedded in sometimes it can just be for instance using ssh methods so you know if it's a really really technical project that perhaps just isn't space uh, it'd be a huge distraction it wouldn't fit within the cool scope to do something really socially scientific but then it is normally some sort of scope to try and do um some sort of methods, whether it's like interviews or some sort of uh, social science methodology for a literature review or a workshop with technical experts. Do you know what I mean? Something that's actually quite an SSH method without it being an SSH concept. And I think that those are, are quick wins, which which do add a lot to these sorts of projects. Um, and then maybe just really quickly, if I may, I, I'd noted down sort of a, a possible example, which which are maybe are. Uh, Moving, move, moving perhaps back to, to what was already talked about when, when you posed the previous questions, uh, looking for wins around how research impact and teaching can be combined. So one example that we've done is, you know, we've worked with, uh, for instance, UK government and other, other stakeholders to set us a research problem um, to do some research on a particular issue, which will then feed into their policy making agenda, so research in, um, impact tick, but then the person that we're then using to do it, in, for instance, is a master's or a PhD student and it's built within their, their program of learning. So again, you're getting all three at the same time. So I think trying to do those sorts of things, I could imagine that that, that would be really, really interesting to pursue for some EUA members. Great, thanks, Chris. And, and then moving on to uh, the comments that you made, Simone. I mean, I think you were very clear about uh, your views on the notion of uh, green growth uh, linked to very much being an integral part of the Green Deal. So, you know, we should maybe spend a little bit of time thinking about that. And I, I mean, in a sense, what would you say to the people who raise the issue about sustainability, about resources, about the continued supply of, for example, precious elements for wind turbines or electrodes in, in batteries for electric vehicles and so on? And the sense in which, you know, some people think green growth simply presents an unrealistic solution in that continued enhancements and reduction of cost of technology will will enable solutions. And I mean, linking that, I guess, a little bit to the comments you made about partnerships between the global north and the global south. And, you know, what to what extent can we learn about sustainable lifestyles from the global south? You know, so maybe some sort of thoughts and reflections on that from you. Yeah, well, you know, I think that uh, the idea of uh, of green growth uh, is not necessarily something that uh, requires or wants to require uh, utilization of natural resources as the one we have. So it's clear that the circular economy represents uh, a very important part of the European Green Deal itself, exactly for the reason that uh, there is a willingness, uh, there is a clear policy target to, um, to move our economy from a linear approach that we currently have to a more circular one, which might really provide important solutions also for the uh, specific issue you mentioned. So, for example, one question we often heard is, OK, but uh, what do we make with these electric vehicles, given that uh, they are so mineral uh, intensive? No, we, we require... Uh, the, the, the manufacturing of the vehicles and the batteries in particular require a lot of minerals and metals that are often mined in uh, certain countries in the world, almost uh, entirely processed in China, etc. Again, I think that's a very good example about how much innovation can be important. No? So if you the case of battery, the, uh, the, the new generation of batteries, solid state batteries, would require way less minerals mm -hmm. and would significantly decrease as such the carbon footprint of that technology. Mm -hmm. And one very important element here is that in Europe, we might have the possibility of turning this circular economy into a huge industrial possibility for the continent because some of the uh, companies that are at the front for, at the forefront of these are Europeans indeed and this is in my view one important element of the green industrial strategy that uh, we should be developing in in Europe and this would by the way since we are talking 
under a very specific geopolitical context here, this would also uh, help Europe to avoid uh, in the future the geopolitical risks we currently have and we see those very clearly these days by depending on external suppliers and in particular to individual suppliers. So in, to be very clear, we don't want uh, uh, in the green transformation to jump from being reliable on Russia for gas to being reliable on China for raw materials and uh, related uh, green technologies. And uh, that's why we need also these uh, innovation push. That's why we need the substitution. That's why we need also to develop the supply chains in Europe in order to gather the so-called strategic autonomy, which basically means not being over-dependent on a single supplier for a certain good that is strategic at the end of the day for, for our economy. So I think that uh, this is uh, indeed flagging the importance of research again. And if we get there, I think... Uh, uh, this is one of the elements that can ensure that uh, our economies keep, keep growing and this growth should not be reliant on material growth, on uh, energy resources or natural resources use overall can also be intangible, as we know, and that's exactly where our economies are going. But uh, uh, the idea of compromising growth, uh, uh, I think it's, uh, it's not sustainable and indeed any government would subscribe to that uh, also because it's not really clear what should be grow what element of the of the equation should go down. Yeah, th thanks, Simone. And I mean, Cathy, from your perspective, from the uh, European Environment Agency, you know, what's your view on, on sort of uh, green growth? Well, actually, at the end of last year, we published a report called Reflecting on Green Growth, and mm -hmm. Simone contributed to the work in that report. I did too in a small way. So I've actually just put it up in the handout section. Uh -huh. And so I won't repeat a lot of what somebody mm -hmm. said, but also to say that there were very diverse views. And even within mm -hmm. a small team, you don't get agreement on this. People come with very different perspectives and it's quite hard. So we managed to achieve a shared understanding, but we never managed to achieve agreement. And essentially, what it, you know, one of the premises in, in the report, it does a bit of history and things, but it, it, you know, there's this assumption sometimes that because an increase in GDP basically based on resources of is harmful. But that doesn't necessarily mean that reduced GDP growth, GDP growth will automatically be beneficial for the environment. You know, the one doesn't necessarily follow the other. And under our current system, reduced GDP growth just actually creates a whole different set of problems, really, a whole different set of, of tricky problems to deal with as well around tax bases and fiscal sustainability and things like that. So, you know, there is no panacea here. Degrowth is not the answer to the dominance of the economic growth model. You just create a different set of problems that you have to deal with. So, you know, at the core really is, should we waste, should we get involved in this big argument about growth versus degrowth or rather think more about, you know, what do we want our economies to achieve? How do we really tackle this issues around decoupling and our material use? And, you know, a focus then maybe more and more like fiscal sustainability and resilience, thinking about the outcomes you want and whether you achieve growth or not on the way to getting there, that shouldn't be your primary objective, really. It's, it's what are you trying to do here? Um, rather than getting caught up in this growth versus degrowth argument, which nobody will ever win, I think. Yeah, thanks very much, Cathy. I mean, I think that highlights, you know, the role that universities have to play in clarifying the debate and coming to a, a clear consensus about what it is that people are trying to achieve. And also, I think, bringing some light onto a, a terminology that means different things to different people. So thank you. Um, we've just got time for a sort of quick discussion before we, we move on and, and open up for um wider consultation um, through polls and questions for participants. So, um, Chris, I'd like to turn to you now. So one of the things that you talked about was this link from knowledge to policy. And obviously the idea there is that then policy is something that shapes and informs and directly impacts the views of citizens, European citizens and, well, all citizens. And, you know, what... So from your perspective, you know, what is the best approach to really clearly communicate to citizens what they need to know to sort of play a, you know, play a key role in this Green Deal, this energy transition? Because I think sometimes there is a lack of clarity or indeed quite a lot of um, um, 
inaccurate information that's presented to citizens. So, you know, how would you approach, you know, from a university perspective, the, the best strategy for communicating what the citizens uh, would ideally like to know or should know? <clears throat> Thank you. That's a, a good and big question. Uh, I uh, so I mean, there's, there's there's various things. Firstly, I suppose I would be hesitant about putting too much reliance on communication and information provision. I'd say for decades now, um, social science research has shown that providing someone with information, increasing their knowledge will not always lead to action. Of course, there are examples of that change, but often that knowledge accumulation has led to bigger things changing in society. As a result, sometimes because of sometimes leading to, uh, it, it, it's, it's different, but, but it, you know, whether it's smoking or alcohol or turning the light switch off, um, it's, it's not all just about because we know more, we act in a certain way. Um, and obviously, you know, there's, there's plenty of examples out there around you may want to get the bus, but if the infrastructure is not there to allow you to get the bus, what will that allow you to happen? So I think there's bigger things there away just from um, information. Uh, but certainly at the same time, I think in terms of how universities are set up to engage with citizens, it's important for it not to be done tokenistically so and not to be done at the sort of end of pipe. So, you know, once the once the knowledge has been created, then it's rolled out. The ideal thing is if there's me mechanisms there to sort of co-create the knowledge with them, whether the citizens are the target audience or not. But I suppose giving marginalised voices, vulnerable groups, platforms in ways that they wouldn't normally have, giving them space to define the problem. Uh, you know, if, if we're looking at transitions, whether it's energy, mobility, um, you know, whether it's to do with our, our use of natural resources or biodiversity. These are all social problems which connect to the way that societies work. So for me, it always feels appropriate at the start of any project or any engagement exercise to just ask them what they think and what they want, and where they want to go and what they think is right and give them the platform uh, and then try to co-create a uh, the sort of a common definition of a problem before we even start getting to solutions. And then, then I think, you know, from then on, we'll probably have the best chance. Great. Thank you very much, Chris, for those sort of thoughts and reflections. So what I'd like to do now is maybe get a little bit of feedback from the participants in the webinar. So we have our, our final poll, um, just to get a sense of where you think the greatest improvement is needed on the, on the Green Deal based on what you've read and some of the things that we've discussed. Um, so let's see where um, the responses. <clears throat> um, so I'm beginning to see some responses coming in now. <clears throat> So involvement of local communities, intersectoral collaboration, sort of two highest, funding and advice to policymakers a bit lower down. <clears throat> so again, you know, quite a wide spectrum of, of views reflecting the diversity of um, the different institutions and different roles within institutions. So the poll will sort of remain open just for a, a little bit longer, so you have opportunity to respond. But I think the one that comes out at the top is intersectoral collaboration. And I mean, that's quite um, interesting because that's you know one of the key themes that has come out through the development of this position paper. Um, and also, I think, has come out through the discussions that we've had today, the need that we would like to see greater interactivity between all the various sectors, the commission, sort of industry, the universities, um, policymakers, citizens groups, and so on. So this idea of co-creation that emerges through it, collaboration, um, I think, is uh, really important. So we have time just before we draw things to an end, maybe to go back to um, questions 
from the um, participants here. So just um, looking at some of the questions. Um, so there's a question here from Alexander Petu. It says, speaking about TRL in the context of the European Green Deal and universities and data on social acceptance, could we also tackle the topic of societal readiness level and mainstreaming to accompanying TRL um, assessments? Well, Chris, maybe I can go to you first because you mentioned this. You know, what's your sort of reflection on what we could usefully do with the concept of societal readiness? Um, from what I, from what I understand it, the, the the ideas of societal readiness levels are much less developed than, of course, mm -hmm. TRLs that have been around for quite some time, um, and have, I suppose have uh, a, a less of a, a theoretical thing and, and have been much more rolled out uh, across mm -hmm. big investments over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing to start pivoting towards something that's more socially sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, I think before we did, though, before anyone did, I, I would certainly endorse a, a more of deeper engagement with SSH communities on how those levels are defined. We know from experience, once we commit to something like that, like the TRLs, that you get somewhat locked in uh, for many years to come. So um, I think I think a deeper a deeper discussion would be needed. At the moment, I can't really see it happening, even though I, I would like to see that sort of thing happening. Instead, what I would imagine would happen would there be some dedicated funding calls that would mention mm. SRLs, as opposed to it sort of threading through um, all sorts of funding calls. Um, mm. and actually, all evaluators seem to be quite familiar with TRLs, whereas you ask funding evaluators what SRLs are and they'll probably mostly look blankly at you. So I guess it's probably a, a longer term project and that's probably why I'm keener to step back and start defining those levels with the right people before mm -hmm. we start moving to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. And, and I mean, Simone, what are your sort of reflections on the idea of this society readiness level? Well, on that, uh, I, uh, I think the, you know, the, the European Green Deal uh, communication talks about this European uh, social uh, compact, social pact uh, that uh, would really like to uh, basically uh, foster this bottom-up approach to the initiative rather than only uh, having the, the top-down. Mm -hmm. And of course, that is uh, very important if you think about the role that also behavioral change might play in this transformation. And uh, mm -hmm. it is pretty interesting, again, to come back to, the, to, the, to what we are seeing uh, these days, uh, the, the way the, the Commission has uh, approached uh, the issue of security of gas supply, uh, flagging how uh, individual behavioral change can matter. No? So this estimation that if we all turn down the thermostat by one degree Celsius, we can spare seven percent of the European gas demand. Uh, tells a lot about how now, in a, in a moment of urgency, we can see these um, individual action being very important. That was flagged already in a more general and theoretical manner in the European Green Deal communication. Now we understand that this is can really, really be important and really be timely. So. I think that uh, having this kind of engagement uh, with society will be very relevant and essential if we are to, to really speed up the carbonization. And uh, uh, some numbers were put down by the uh, impact assessment of the European Green Deal itself in terms of how much this can bring uh, spare investments, additional investment requirements for the transition, which is significant. It's around 100 billion per year that we would spare in Europe as less green investments requirements uh, to mm -hmm. the transformation. So mm -hmm. I think this is very important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I mean, Cathy, from your perspective, from the environmental um, side, how would you see this? Well, I don't think I've got anything specific that I would want to add to, to really what the others have, have said, really. OK, that's fine. Thank you. Well, I'm conscious that we've approached the time where it's close to the end of um, the webinar. So let me, first of all, thank the three panel members very much for what has been a really interesting and insightful um, discussion. 
And what I'd like to do now is really to um, sort of wrap up and draw things to a conclusion. And let me also say that I can see a number of really interesting um, questions that have come in on the chat from participants. So apologies that we haven't had time to, to go through, through those and answer them. But I think what that illustrates is that there is a real desire for a continued dialogue and discussion and an ongoing um, approach to thinking about what the Green Deal means for each of us in our roles, whether it's in universities, whether it's in policy making, or whether it's in um, industry. So I think we all recognize that, you know, energy is a deeply embedded um, issue for society. You know, at the moment, we have something like um, 7 billion people living on the planet. And, and collectively, you know, we, we use the equivalent of about 18 terawatts of power uh, on an ongoing basis. And the result of that is that we pump something like um, just over 50 gigatons of CO2 equivalent into the atmosphere, which is something like seven tons um, of CO2 equivalent per person on the planet. And of course, that's very unevenly distributed. The per capita um, emissions um, range by almost a factor of 100 between the sort of lowest and the highest emitting uh, per capita emissions. So there is a, a deeply embedded problem there. And I think what, some of what this discussion has highlighted is the consequences of thinking about the Green Deal and the energy transition and the move to net zero. And, you know, all of us have very much in our minds the discussions at the recent um, UN Conference of Parties, COP26 conference, and the challenges that that presented and the negotiations. And, you know, we will all have our own views on whether we thought COP was a success or COP was not a success. And, you know, each of us has um, to sort of think about that and, and come to a sort of considered view. And today we've presented our uh, position paper, which was primarily um, de um, designed really to sort of challenge um, and create discussion. And I'm really pleased to say that I think it's, it's successfully managed to do that. You know, we welcome very much the idea and the principle of the Green Deal. I think many of us would recognise that the long-term challenge presented by uh, climate change is one of the greatest um, challenges and threats that our civilization faces. So I think it's incumbent on all of us to engage with the, um, the principle behind the Green Deal and seek to develop solutions that will enable us to continuing the kinds of lifestyle and societies and countries that we want to be part of whilst also recognizing that some of our behaviors and some of our um, actions do have consequences. And, you know, the position paper set out very importantly, the uh, significant role that universities as a sector can play in terms of bridging gaps, in terms of having both the breadth of knowledge and the capacity and the range of expertise in different sectors, in terms of having an understanding of the difference in the energy system right across um, the EUA membership from um, sort of Iceland in the, in the West through to Eastern Europe and the very different context that each of those different countries will have. And of course, when you make a transition, you have to begin from where you are and end up where you want to get to. And so I hope very much that the position paper is something that you will use as a reference document, that it will present some opportunities for ongoing discussion for you in your universities. And, you know, EUA is very keen to support um, membership. And, you know, we hope that going forward, we have um, this task and finish group that um, was mentioned at the beginning today. So do look out for a call and further information. And there will be opportunity for um, individuals who want to get in, apply to get involved with this uh, Green Deal um, task and finish group. And there will be an opportunity to develop the thinking that's been set out in the position paper. And the first stage will be to develop a roadmap for taking forward and how EUA can support 
the um, the um, individual actions of its 800 or so uh, members. And alongside that, I think it's really important that we continue to have ongoing discussions um, of the type that we've had today. You know, so just reflecting very briefly on some of the things that our three panelists have said, you know, we've had a provocation about what is knowledge, the role of knowledge in finding effective solutions, not just in solving problems. And, you know, an articulation of a vision for a new type of framework for education and knowledge. And this idea that we need to think about how we can break down silos. You know, so for example, you know, some universities have begun to think much more about using the UN Sustainable Development Goals as a knowledge framework so that you can begin to think about how you train and prepare um, and educate students and give students a, a lived experience that enables them to engage more effectively um, with the challenge. We've heard an interesting discussion about the concept of green growth, which is by no means um, sort of come to a final uh, consensus and decision. You know, we've heard a range of views expressed. And, you know, green growth is very much at the heart of uh, the Green Deal. You know, it's set out as one of um, the key aspirations of the Green Deal to see Europe continue to develop um, on a green growth basis. And that raises the question, what exactly do we mean by green growth? How will we achieve it? What role will our universities play in helping to give a clear understanding of green growth and support programs of education, of training, of professional development, of lifelong learning that enable um, Europe's citizens to have an understanding of what that means and what the individual choices might then come to them as a result of that. And then we've heard, you know, from Chris, who spent, you know, much of his career thinking about the role of social sciences and humanities and how that needs to be integrated in a holistic way into, you know, the way that we approach um, solving this problem. You know, it's not an add-on, you know, you don't design a wind turbine and then ask people what they think about it. You know, you have to co-create at the very start, you know, this informed understanding of what society is, of how individuals in society think about energy, what their views are, what their hopes, what their aspirations are, and take them with you on this, this journey of discovery and understanding of potential solutions to the energy challenge. And linked to that is, you know, how we engage with citizens. You know, the Commission has very clear aims and aspirations in terms of how it wishes to engage with citizens and have citizens informed. But that then raises the question, what is the role for universities? How can universities play um, a, a sort of act as a bridge bringing to bear all the expertise and knowledge that different um, academics and different disciplines have in terms of seeing you know social sciences and humanities as a key pillar alongside technology alongside policy and alongside all the other sort of dimensions of um, the approaches to solve this problem so thank you very much for joining and participating in today's webinar um, at the moment, it feels like we've raised probably more questions and answers, but that's not necessarily a bad thing because the debate and the discussion will continue. And, you know, we look forward to continued engagement with the EUA through this um, task and finish group. Um, and we hope that at your own institutions, we've stimulated some thinking and some opportunities for you to assess how you might engage with and support the vision of the Green Deal, which will ultimately uh, lead to a better future for all of us. So on that note, let me thank you all for joining and participating in this webinar. Let me thank again uh, the pa um, our panellists and um, those who work behind the scenes to put um, the webinar together to Stefan and colleagues at EUA uh, and I wish you all a good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you.